that I would do. So, uh, yeah, that, that'll be done running up soon. So, uh, yeah, that'll be exciting to do. Um, but you hear me on a, bridge, on a bridge end lesson anyway, Anne, on a Wednesday. Hey, it could be, you could, you could ask the care home if you could do it there. And they, oh, the trouble is they wouldn't pay you. <laughs> they probably wouldn't pay you. Yeah, I think um, Rosman knows the uh, landlady to uh, a pub nearby. Oh, um, yeah. And failing that, she knows someone of the community centre to put it in. So uh, yeah. just hoping that she's getting well enough yeah. as well. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of people like could be available in Lantrit, uh, Dennis Powys. I mean, I, I, I was hoping that going to, um, you know, going, going to the Cabal Roche, it might encourage a different group of people to come, you know, mm. like, uh, from that area. Yeah. You might get more Catholics coming. <laughs> Catholics? <laughs> you don't want them. The Catholic Church. You I don't want them. I was going to put a poster in. Although I've never had any, you know, so far. But, uh, yeah. So, yeah, is that all right tomorrow then? Will you be able to do the cab part? We yeah, it's, it's only a little bit further on up the road, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it is. So only about 100 metres, probably. Yeah, I had a look on the map. It's, it's quite simple um, to get to. So it's fine, and I'll... Uh, be there but you won't be joining tomorrow will you oh yeah um i'm just hoping that my my online uh appointment will be over by say half past one you know and then i can yeah zoom off down to because i haven't actually introduced myself or anything i've, I've done it by text you know but yeah they seem, they seem very nice and um you know used to having people in so uh, I th- I'm sure it'll be fine. But Bill will be coming. Dell will be coming. And, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if Pat. Hey, Pat, bring your sister yeah, in law along. Yeah, my husband said I can come. He can, he'll take over. So. What did I'll, he say? Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, great. Oh, great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right. Um, got everything now, finally. Um, oop. Get, get all my notes. Um, so today, um, I just want to ask: Is there any news? Um, Anne, any news? Um, archaeological. No, I've just been looking at all the things online. Really, there's a lot of stuff coming up about um, witches and uh, mm. you know Halloween type times a year, and um, yeah, there was uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, you no, know, that's fine, Anna. There has been quite a few things, obviously, um, with the HS2 um, finding oh. those lovely statues. Yes, that was good. That, um, that was good because I, I did comment that it's probably the only positive thing to come out of it, you know, that yeah. all this excavation. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 I think it, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it, where you, you're thankful that it's bringing up all this archaeology and knowledge. But mm. At the same time, it's, it's really disappointing because it's decimating the, land, yeah, yeah. the landscape, you know. But still, it, you might as well learn the knowledge while we can. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think one of the f- favourite things of news this week actually, that, that, that I wanted to join. I think you might like this, Anne, really. It's absolutely beautiful. It's gold ring with an amethyst, amethyst stone found in um, in Israel, so from the Byzantine period, which is, um, oh. if anyone can see it, it's oh, absolutely gosh. beautiful. Yeah. Um, but I don't know whether my phone's doing justice for it, but it, the, the amethyst in it is beautiful, the detailing, and I always mm-hmm. love that. Um, it looks really modern, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. It would be something that I would sort of uh, wear around. I love my amethyst. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... I wear my birthstone with amethyst, but I think it's ruby. Oh, no, garnet. Garnet. Oh, yeah. garnet's nice, Anne. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd love a garnet ring. Okay. <laughs> I mean... Garnet's at uh, St David's Head. Pardon? You'll find garnet at St David's Head. Will I? Yes. 
I my daughter in geology, she took me there and showed me how to find them. Well, I have to dig for them. Oh, uh, you can chip them off the rocks. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, You've got to look for them. <laughs> you watch how there'll be a flood of people going down to that area, Peter. <laughs> They've well, seen it on YouTube. Like, like well, it's there, been known for one. years. <laughs> Geologists know all about it. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. It would be quite interesting. I think I might look into that, Peter. You've actually sparked an interest there. There you go. Uh, thank you. Is there any news off you, Peter, this week? No. No? no. Okay, perfect. Um, Richard, um, Richard, thank you for sending over that stuff as well. I've had a look at it just before we started, so thank you so much. Oh, no problem. I found some other stuff, so I'll try and sort that out in the yeah, no, that's cool. Like, I, I, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, you've helped me big time. But is there any news from you this week? No, no, nothing really. <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you. And Pat, any news this week? No, no. No, that's fine. Um, so today we're going to um, be jumping on in. I thought I would do, uh, I've called it Roman Anglesey, um, because we will be looking at the Romans and their relationship with Anglesey here. Um, but hopefully um, I've kind of opened it up for us to actually um, look at maybe Anglesey um, and ooh, why am I not clicking on the right thing? Anglesey um, with uh, the rural settlements and the, the people that are already lived there. So I'll be opening it up to that. Um, but first we'll talk about uh, the, the, the roads in Roman Anglesey. So um Obviously, um, th this is a very interesting area and it was something that caught my interest um, from a book that I was reading and they pinpointed, it was a quite a good book. Um, however, I started to see there were some things in there that really annoyed me. Um, one of them was uh, the mention, well, there was Celts being mentioned left, right and centre and then you had the word Druids, etc. And I know that in Carl's new book, he expresses his dislike for the use of uh, use of the word Celt or Celtic, um, and, and and I agree. And obviously, we only have one uh, documented uh, piece of evidence of um, Druids, for example, and it was by the Romans. So at the same time, it does sort of make you think of whether that is what we we the Celts call them. the Romans of everything they knew. But this. The, the Celts taught the Romans, but then at the same yeah. time, did the, the Romans actually generally not... If there's only one source of Druid and there's no source from Celtic or um, people of Britain, for example, who's to say that they called it Druids and not something else? And that's a name that was given by the Romans, for example. So yeah. th 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 there's a lot of debate on that, and I know a lot of people debate on it, and I think it's one of those things that really sort of gets to people when it comes to, obviously, spirituality. I see that quite often. Um, I think there was some individual online that was claiming that they were a Druid themselves. Um, but it was quite interesting to see what they had to say. Um, but I thought we'll go to Anglesey because um, it's definitely something fantastic. I wish I could have looked at Anglesey, really, um, in the medieval period for my dissertation because there's so much going on there. Um, however, I just thought we'll look at the, the Roman period and we'll slowly progress with you guys. And this is why I decided to take on this type of uh, uh, lesson instead of just medieval now, because I thought it'd be nice to have a look at um, all of Wales and its connections as well. And um, the, the, it said that the Romans had invaded North West Wales in 60 to 61 um, AD, which is also something that people debate on whether which year but it could be towards the end and the beginning of the next year but um it was successful however this individual at pulling us um was drawn away by Boudicca and her revolt and so um this conquest was not so successful as argued by some historians but when we get to 77 AD this is when we start to see um a, a long-term occupation of the Romans in this period and um I think I think when you look at the uh, Cadu book on this, it can be a bit frustrating um, on what they've uh, written. Um, some of it you can sort of say, oh, yes, I agree with that. And some of them you could say no. Um, however, um, I, I've kind of found that you, if you read between the lines of a lot of academic literature, sometimes you can just see how 
the, the, the truth is there is just people add to it with their own opinions. But this Kazu book, um, I, I, I was a bit impressed, really, because they just focused not just on the Romans, but also um, the, 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 the people of Anglesey as well. Um, which I thought was absolutely fantastic because it wasn't just all about the Romans. It's something that people always jump to. So um, there is literature being created of these two invasions of Anglesey. And then after that, there was no Roman literature of this area at all. But it seemed like this area was very important to the Romans for trading, um, especially with copper and definitely something that, I think allowed them to just further just progress with their power. But there's no archaeological evidence at the moment of civic centres or prestigious dwellings or um, but there is evidence of these military installments, these forts that are there. And I think really what I'm seeing from this here is that um the people that already lived in Anglesey, um they, they, they were working quite well in a way with the Romans. It, it seemed like it wasn't something that was completely 110% um, oppressive, but um, I think it was because it, it's that whole idea where they were able to live in their own little uh, hill forts uh, and, and rural settlements, and they just kept away. And from the map that I could see here, the uh, rural settlements that they have found here um, are more or less not that close to the forts, um, the Roman forts, which I thought was quite interesting. So I think it, 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 I think they were able to keep them at arm's length, but carry on living the way that they lived without any, any stress. And what we will look at is one rural um, settlement that is in St. Vagans. You can go and see it. It's obviously been reconstructed in St. Vagans. Um, but the, the archaeological report that I've read on that was absolutely interesting and definitely shows that there's some sort of trading or relationship with the Romans and something that, that the people of Anglesey did benefit from. So I thought I'd have a look at all this and try and see if uh, uh, all the uh, evidence there, and I think the evidence there is quite rich, is, is really fantastic to look at. Um, and the, it, the, the online information of it is it's really good. Um, however, sometimes it can be quite limited with some certain things. You have to delve deeper. But I think that's what you get with anything that's quite academic here. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, produce some discussion about some of the uh, some of the things that are only accessible on academic articles. Um, I personally think that um, th there was some sort of druid system in um Wales at the time, but I don't think they could have possibly been called Druids. Maybe they were called something else, and it was, that was a, a Roman name that was given to it. Like I said, there was only one actual um, the evidence that is discussing this. Um, and it, I think one thing that I thought was quite interesting is what uh, Anglesey was called, and it was at Moa, um, which was uh, definitely what the name that it was, and something that has obviously changed as time has gone on. But they absolutely detailed history of this area is absolutely fantastic um like i said there is some references here so uh tictus uh tactic tactic um he recorded that um and this is something that is from his uh this is a roman author so he says here ranks of warriors lined the ankle seashore and urged by their women streaking like furies dressed in burial black while druids with arms outstretched to heaven cursed the invaders. And I, I think here, what we're seeing here is it's, it's almost like um, the seeing these druids, maybe these uh, these individuals that, that helped keep the spirituality, that helped keep um, the, the, the community to get it together. Maybe they've seen them as this evil thing that would curse them. And um, it, definitely, I think if you've got people invading, you are going to try and do everything in your way to stop them. But it was quite interesting how you see evidence of this throughout. Um, and I, I, sorry, Anne, I just saw your message on the thing. Um, and I think what, what we're seeing here is there is first hand accounts that have been uh, written here as well. Um, and that's absolutely fantastic. There's more work that's been brought up as well, which is uh, by the father in law of the first person who had written this. And he just talks about how um, uh, how the, 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 this uh, the area looked like and 
how um just what had gone on and this roman conquest onto it i think that was the way the romans were able to keep their history alive as documenting it um but it was just quite interesting that nothing has been written in anglesey afterwards because there's a lot going on in anglesey that i think would be of interest to the romans um anyway so we'll get into it so there were the first site is a uh, kaya gibi i think that's how you say it excuse me if i've got it wrong um and this is absolutely fantastic this is something that you can go and see and um, there is a page online called heritage daily and they do discuss this in great depth and i thought this was absolutely fantastic um and it this is located located in holyhead and and um, i used to call it holyhead as a child it really really pickled my brain um but this is um it, it, like I said, this was recorded in Latin of Moa um, Anglesey, and it was a, an important religious centre is thought of for, um, like I said, the Druids. Um, and if, I think this was definitely an important place for the people of Wales at the time. And I think this is possibly why the Romans decided to come here as well. I think another thing as well is that this is a very good area to have connections with um Ireland, etc. There is a lot of connections going on with Ireland, especially some connections with Scotland as well, which we see with um, Gwynfor Evans in his work. Um, but I think this um, was just a place for the Romans to ensure expansion. And I definitely think that some of the things that we will talk about today was part of the motive. So there is, like I said, lack of archaeological evidence. Um, the, 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 so, to actually discuss what had gone on in the first place. And so historians have suggested that the Romans had used the Druids as a reason to liberate Anglesey. So that first source that I talked about, how these Druids were very evil, they were, they were almost cursing people from invading this land. And all they wanted to do was just try and bring their way of life, the Roman way of life. That's, that it's almost like they see it as a much better, more advanced way of life. Um, of pushing it onto the people of Anglesey. And so they saw the Druids as something that maybe um, they needed to liberate the people of Anglesey from. Um, but again, this is something that's debated. And I think their motives were mostly driven by the wealth, by which is derived from the rich copper mines found on the island, um, personally. I mean, that was what their motive was. Um, and I think it definitely, uh, there is discussion about stopping Irish pirates from going there as well. Um, but this is a, um, a fantastic fortress that you can go in uh, to see. You can see the wall there. This is the top picture at the moment that we're talking about. Um, and um, absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but th this is where they start to go to um, this area here. And um, it, it's a fort, and this coastal fort was about four metres um, in height in, with the walls, and it had four corner towers, um, and it's, it's situated on a cliff face overlooking a small uh, a sing a shingle beach. And it's near a rectangular enclosure plan as well, which is about 47 metres north east to uh, south east by 44 uh, metres. Um, can you hear a tapping noise, Anne? Can anyone else hear a tapping noise? Pat can. Yes, it's mostly annoying. Yeah. Sounds like somebody typing. Sounds All right, like okay. Um, if I stop sharing, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, yeah, just tap, 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 tap. Yeah. <laughs> Like as if someone's typing, you know. Hang on, I just... I think it's my charger, I'm not sure. Can you hear it now? Because no. Carl's not here, I'm on Carl's... It probably was my charger um, oh, okay. for the laptop. Oh. <laughs> I think the laptop's on his last legs, to be oh, honest okay. with you. <laughs> okay. Hopefully that's sorted now. Okay. Good, thank you. Know? No, it's fine. Um, the, apologies for that. So, um, and it, it's connected to a, an area called Kairi Tour, um, which was an, it's thought to be an Iron Age hill fort that was then later used as a watchtower by the Romans, which we can see on the bottom image here. And um, it's thought that these two areas 
were both abandoned by 393 AD. Um, and this is possibly in response to the re- uh, redeployment of troops from Britannia during the revolt of um, the Eugenius of uh, Gaul, which is leaving the local Romano-British population of Anglesey to fend for itself almost. Um, but th- if you look at the images online, you can definitely see how this has been a great big wall on this fort. Um, but it, the, the history of this never ends after 393 AD. We, we get to the 6th century AD, and this old fort was given um, by king of uh, the King of Gwynedd, which is the, the name is at the bottom of Mile Gwyn, of uh, St. Sibi. Uh, I again might have got it wrong but he found in a monastery here inside these uh, fortress walls and I like this here because they're in Anglesey we're seeing a lot of discussion of these sites not just ceasing to exist afterwards but they seem to ever be used to uh, to rebuild other buildings nearby or they might be uh, still used in some other way and I think that's absolutely fantastic here and we will look at one site where it's basically been ransacked in the medieval period for um, a building of another building and there is a church of seems to be here that stands on the site that this today it's a small detached chapel it's called Iglois Ibed which is um is, it stands over the grave of this saint um this uh, the said to be there um but th- they've definitely sort of understood why this is such an important place and it, I think it definitely shows because um, when you look at the uh, map that I have, I'm not sure whether you'd be able to see it, but I'll show it to you in a bit. But just before you get to Anglesey, before you go over that little bit of water, you obviously have a, a Roman fort called um, Stignometum there. Um, but this one is on the island that's obviously northwest. And it, it seems like they've got them in a very good corner of uh, which way, because it seems like it doesn't, they've stopped them from connection with the mainland from anyone sort of invading. And they've also stopped them on the other side from maybe anyone from Ireland or um, the Isle of Man or, or, or Scotland to actually sort of invade. So I thought it was quite interesting to see that really um, and how it's been planned. Um, and I do think that, uh, that Cadu has done a good job with this small book. It's just, I wish they'd done more on there really, but that even though this is thought to be um, abandoned around 393 AD, they've given the uh, conquest and the coexistence um, from 60 AD to 400 AD. So again, shapes of this are debated and it's really frustrating because sometimes you just want to know the exact um, date. But we get to this one here, which is absolutely fantastic to actually look at. So this is just before you go to Anglesey. This is on the mainland, um, but this is something that's connected with it. And this was thought to be um, something that was created in uh, 77 AD. And they, they, they talk about this, but this for three centuries, this was the centre of Roman control in northeast Wales. And I think this was definitely something in connection with Anglesey. Um, and you can definitely have a look at it online. There's a lot of things written about this online, but they definitely think that this... This is something that is a stronghold. This shows that there was a strong, a Roman stronghold here. And it is something that has been kept in a Welsh um, legend, Welsh discussion, Welsh oral history as well. But it's, it's there, it's for you to see. And I love how you can see all that just planned out. Um, I know, um, for example, Cadu had, draw, uh, had created their own one. Um, I, I think it was a good way of doing it. I think they could have used a better um, aerial photography image of the land so that we could fit in quite nicely. But you could see where they believe that this fort could have been. This is a big, big fort. Um, clearly, they saw importance to Anglesey. And so they wanted to create a stronghold here so they could get people of Anglesey cornered. And um, so they could, again, further establish their power. Um, but this is thought to be uh, founded by... Um, Agricola in um, 77 AD, um, but he was brutally suppressed by a rebellion by the native tribe known as the Ordofis, uh, um, and they, they were. It was designed to hold 1,000 strong regiments of auxiliary infantrymen, um, but it was linked by Roman roads that went to bases like Chester 
and even Carleon. Um, Carleon is all the way down to North Wales, so you can imagine um, this is well connected. And it's nice that we get a little bit of South Wales into this discussion here as well. Um, so Chester and Carleon is uh, where this fort was having roads to, to connect it to. Um, and I think this was just to, again, is, is to control um, the, the Welsh coast, is control Anglesey. Um, again, this discussion of Irish pirates coming into here as well. But they did find some coins here. There was coins that were found in this site. And they know that the Romans had stayed in this area from 394 AD, so one year after the previous site. Um, and they think that no other fort in Wales has been held this long by the Romans. Um, but it's absolutely fantastic. I think when you find a coin, it's, uh, it's an absolute gem because sometimes it can just give you that exact date of when it was last used. Um, but it, this, again, this was a place to uh, further be brought into Welsh legend. Like I said, you've got Caer Abbas at Sant, which is the fort of the mouth of the Saint River, which is mentioned in the dream of the Maxen um, Welid, um, which is one of the ancient tales of the Mabinogi. Uh, Mabinogi, I think I said it right. Um, obviously, um, that's something, again, if you want to look at Mabinogi, I think that's what the Lord of the Wing Rings is actually based off. So I think Welsh legend is something that's very strong in Wales. Um, and I get, again, I think the whole legend and myth aspect, it adds the magic to it. Um, and I think that's why I liked Cornwall as well, because this this magic, this the, the legend, the stories of uh, um the Piskies, etc. And then with Wales, you have um, our own little spin on it. And I think they're very similar um, with keeping the magic alive in his archaeology and his history. Um, but this fort was shaped rather like a, a, um, a, 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 it was shaped in a very unusual way. So it, there was defences of earth and timber being placed um, around here. So you can definitely see how um, they've got different types of building here. They do think that timber would have been used in some parts of the building as well on the inside, but they would have had this strong defensive wall all around it. And obviously th this is, um, go on, Anne, could you go and say something? That's an Arvon castle in the distance then. Yes. So, so this is an ideal spot, isn't it? You know, they, they. I mean, that was, you know, it was before Carnarvon Castle was built. But I was just thinking they chose it as well. You yeah, know, the I, Romans chose it, that area. Yeah, I think the Romans left a legacy in a way. But from what I could see from uh, the, the, the medieval period, is obviously this is an uh, an exact formula. Um, and Richard will know what we would talk about. I said, um, normally when I look for a, a settlement, I have this formula where I look for a castle, evidence of a manor house, possibly evidence of where there could be trade. So obviously for me, it was the focus of the coast Um and harbours and ports um, but I think whenever you see a castle or a, and if the castle's near the fort I think you start to see how this area um, was able to uh, ensure um, this area was important to people throughout time and I think they understood that it was important for trade it was important to keep the stronghold it's important for power um, and I think that's definitely why we sometimes see um, it, it, places like um, South Wales, for example, really slowly being taken uh, by the Normans at Cardiff Castle, for example, I think it highlights how there's, it is an important occupation. It is not far then from any Roman evidence that we have nearby. Um, I think Cardiff is a very weird one personally in terms of the Roman period. Um, like I said, with Carl's book, um, because I, I, I smiled when I looked at Carl's book, because he, he mentioned a few sites that live around the corner from me. Um, but it, I, I always think that if you have all these sites in these areas, because I'm not very close to uh, the coast and I'm not very close to the city centre. So I just thought, why was there so much going on? It definitely, to me, shows that there was something going wrong around here. Um, but I think Carl Leon's definitely an important place as well. Norman saw that as an important place to actually take hold of. And I think it's because seeing those Roman structures as well are absolutely impressive. And the, it's almost like the first mark of why this area is important for so many reasons. Very strategic location. Um, but what we see in here, um, what they think that there is evidence of, is um, remains of a shrine, 
um, a strong room for the, the page test and there's a basilica for the commanding officer um, where the commanding officer would issue orders and hold court and the marital as well. Um, but unfortunately, this, this area starts to disappear in a way, um, not completely, but the structure starts to slowly disappear because medieval builders and their craftsways start taking bits of these plundered stones from, um, to help create Edward the First's magnificent, magnificent uh, castle at Carnarvon, which um, you've mentioned, Anne. So all the building material for this fort went over to the castle that's over in the corner over there, um, here. So we went from, the, and I th again, I think that's fantastic because sometimes looking for a castle can tell you whether there's a reuse of Roman material nearby. Um, and again, I just, it, it's frustrating because it, it's more of an interesting story to what happened to that structure, but sometimes I wish it was still there for us all to actually experience. Mm -hmm. um, but it's thought that this fort was um, surrounded by a settlement or a, 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 um, a vic Victus, um, which is a camp full of followers, traders, and eventually it would be family of the soldiers. And you can see uh, traces of a garrison bathhouse and even a guest house and a temple to the god uh, Mithras as well. So there is a lot going on here. And it, it, again, I think it just highlights why they, they wanted to plonk their way here, strategic location to get to Anglesey, strategic location for trade, and it was keeping them well connected with uh, Chester as well. And I think, again, it's allowed them to push further um, west. Oh, why is my mouse not working now? Aha, it's working. Um, so this next site is quite interesting because there is a lot of debate going on here with this uh, settlement. Um, some people seem to think, that, now personally, I think from the evidence that I've read, it started off in the Iron Age period and it was just still being occupied during the uh, Roman period um, because they are finding things here that, that suggest that the site had been used further than the Iron Age period. But um, this area is a quarter of a football pitch um, and it's, fascin it's a fascinating ancient village. And I think it, you see remains of these two round huts and these several rectangular buildings encircled by a stone wall, which is five foot by 15 metres thick. I personally think that the rectangular buildings and much later than the circular ones. And I think this could be an, a piece of evidence of Romanization, which we have talked about in uh, previous lectures. Sorry, I've, I've got a, a spider on me. Ooh, um, little mini spider as well. So uh, again, hopefully I'll get some money now. Um, I did find a pound on the floor, but that, that was a nightmare. I ended up knocking down a stand full of chocolate bars on my way to work on a Monday. So uh, it felt like at that point the pound wasn't worth it. Um, but this area was fantastic. I think the rectangular buildings, we have talked about this in another lesson, how they could be a sign of Romanization with the local people. Um, they're moving in from circular to uh, rectangular, really. And I, I think it's, it's an absolutely lovely little fantastic settlement to look at, especially from uh, looking down onto it. And the reconstruction is on the top there. Um, again, people have debated with the reconstruction, but I think when you do reconstructions, it's not going to be entirely correct, um, 110%. Again, always leads me to say, I wish I was... Um, living living in a world where I could time travel because I, sometimes I just want to definitely know about all of this but this um is an absolutely fantastic uh uh area because um of the discussion that's coming out of this as well um so they found a lot of discoveries here um but it, again a lot of people are discussing whether it should be iron age and I, I generally think it was iron age it's just pro progressed throughout time so they were able to find um, coins and pottery and even glass that date back to the that date the settlement back to the late Roman period, which is the third to the fourth century. Um, and from what I've read, that the glass, the pieces of glass that they had found there, um, is thought to be uh, from uh, the Mediterranean. Which, if that's true, that's absolutely fantastic. And goes with my argument of that the Romans obviously brought trade with them, allows us to connect with other um, parts of the world and something that kept with us in the early medieval period. But everyone seems to think that 
when the Romans left, not everyone, obviously, popular uh, culture and the media sort of seen it as when the Romans left, people of uh, Britain and Wales just went backwards, just didn't have a clue on how to trade, etc. But I think the Romans were able to, uh, the reason why I think uh, people were able to get along with the Romans, obviously, it was that oppression part of it. But I generally think as well, um, they realised that they could definitely take what they needed from having a relationship with the Romans in some sort of way. And it is something that has stayed with Wales. So um, I think one thing that they benefited from Romans is this um, this idea of um, this trade and just sort of opening enough to other places. So um, there is, again, these traces of structures are absolutely fantastic to look at and really um, clear as well. Um, and you can just definitely see how this would have just been a very small settlement that would have, uh, it was clearly a farming community as well. And um, they believe that the defensive walls around it was possibly not used for defence, but maybe just to keep um, everything in the community, uh, all the animals in together. And so the, it, it seems like it was built to contain the livestock rather than for defensive purposes. But again, they think that maybe the rectangular buildings weren't to live in. They think that the circular ones were to live in. These one here, these were for domestic use. Um, but they think that these ones here could have been used for um, workshops or barns or um, just storage in total. Because um, I, I love how you can definitely see the entrances to it as well. Um, but absolutely fantastic. It's a shame that they didn't find too much there, but I know the excavation was quite early on in archaeology, so it would be quite interesting to see if they could find any more there. But again, it's that whole issue of funding. And it, it is hidden in a, a wooden grove. Um, so again, I think it just makes it even more magical in my eyes that you can be walking through all these trees and come across this beautiful settlement. Um, and it, like I said, it was the early, uh, early 20th uh, century that these coins and bits of pottery were found. Um, it's thought that they had found, um, oh, I've forgotten the name, uh, samium ware as well there. Um, but not much of it. Um, and a lot of people have discussed whether this is, again, the connection with the Romans. And I definitely think it was. They, they were able to function by themselves. Um, but however, they were able to trade with the Romans, whether that be with their livestock or anything that they had created in their little workshops. Um, this reconstruction isn't that clear, but you can definitely see where they're putting the animals um, in the top right hand corner. So it's like in a barn here. Um, and obviously you've got some other animals that are living in some sort of type of barn here and you've got individuals living in the, the houses and, you see, and I definitely think that the roundhouses would have been a, an ideal place to live, keep all the heat in as well. Um, so the, the, the people who lived there have been obviously local to the area and they lived in roundhouses and like I said they started to adopt this Roman way of life of having these rectangular buildings but when they had the excavations they started to see that there were smelting hoofs found nearby, iron slag found in some of the buildings suggests that maybe that maybe these one of the, the run, one of these rectangular buildings wasn't a barn, wasn't storage but maybe um, evidence of, of Britons actually doing metal work in here and it, it, it's absolutely fantastic because, again, I think it further shows how this is how we're able to trade because there is evidence of us knowing how to have craftsmanship in metalworking. Um, but again, it, it's frustrating when you read about it because it seems like not many people um, are giving you much information. You've got to dig deep. But once you get there, you do get there and you do find some fantastic uh, pieces of information. Um, and again, they found things like um, animal bones were found there. Um, some of those animal bones were made into tools, um, one of them being a musical instrument. Um, but I think this is important for looking at the ac economic activity of the area in terms of uh, iron working um, and perhaps smelting as well in this area. And there was mainly uh, Roman finds here. But the reason why they're discussing on this being an Iron Age settlement was obviously the circular roundhouses. But it was also that there was evidence of a small uh, evidence of this small farming community that was living here as well. And the excavation actually uh, further proved that with the structures. Um, but it was a great deal of remains pre-Roman um, were um, 
seeing how these stones are made out of limestone, local limestone, um, but they were also able to find animal bones which they radiocarbon dated, which uh, it's shown that it was before the Roman period. But it was on a low hill with uh, good views over Anglesey, so I think they were able to uh, keep an eye out on who was uh, there, but while also being hidden. Um, but like I said, it's, it's mostly overgrown more than what it would have been back in the day with sycamore and ash trees. Um, but it, I think it, it would have had these beautiful views all around um, and obviously would have been kept hidden in some sort of way because it was such a, a beautiful piece of land that wasn't very, um, you know, noticeable for anyone that was coming in to uh, the island. Um, so there was definitely something that I thought was absolutely fantastic and one of my uh, favourite pieces of, uh, uh, of information about Anglesey. But we'll get to this mountain here, which is absolutely interesting. When you have a look at the archaeology that they're bringing out here, they're still finding um, copper ingots from here with Roman uh, Latin stamped onto it in areas nearby. Um, however... The archaeology of this is absolutely fantastic. So even just looking at the surface, um, they were able to find that there was evidence of uh, Roman use here. So, and this was thought to be the motive of why the Romans wanted to take over this land. So this was uh, extensively exploited in the late 18th century um, because this was a copper mine. And this started to bring um, the... the, the the discussion. So um, one thing that they found that this goes back to the early Bronze Age period, when they show that the subsurface debris was nearly 4,000 years old, which revealed in the excavations made in 2002. Since then, the, the, the access had been regained to seal the underground workings of the mine revealing further evidence of ancient mines. So if you have a look online, you see these very brave men that are climbing in very small areas in the ground trying to uncover more of our history and archaeology of this fantastic mine. Um, but this, this is um, thought to be very important before the Roman period. Um, but when we get to the 18th century, this is where um, they started to realise that this had some historical uh, purpose. So in the 18th century, miners were working here. And as they were working, they recognised that they were following in the steps of, of much earlier workers than themselves. And this allowed them to find copper ingots that are bearing Roman inscriptions. In 1764, Charles Rowe of Macclesfield was granted a 21-year lease by the... Um, the Balin family, to work on the mountain for copper. Rowland um, Pugh, a local miner, had discovered the great load on the 2nd of March, 1768, and was rewarded with a bottle of whiskey and a rent-free house for his lifetime. It seems like a good job for me. Um, but this, um, the, the, the ore here was very low quality, and um, it, it, it definitely something that people you know, it slowly started to, to, to lose interest into it. Um, but you start to see how the best ore was actually being shipped. Um, so the, the ore was broken into small lumps by hand. The best ore of it then was uh, being shipped to Lancashire or the lower Swansea Valley in South Wales um, through the port of Swansea for smeltings. So again, good connections with South Wales as well. Um, and I think it, you definitely see how kilns, et cetera, are very important in terms of this. Um, but when you look at this, you can definitely see that there's a stream that's run into the mine. Um, it's quite ready looking. This is uh, by the iron salts and the, the water. Um, you definitely see how there's a windmill uh, that, that, that was thought to be um, that, that, that nearby as well. Um, again, you can see that in the distance, not a windmill anymore. Um, but you definitely see how lots of people are still using it right up into the 80s to uh, have, um, well, the 80s, they were able to... Uh, finds about uh, 6,500,000 tonnes of uh, uh, combined zinc, lead, copper and some silver and gold in this as well, in this mining. Um, but the Romans definitely saw this as an important uh, place for um, their trade as well. And you can definitely see there's, um, there's a, um, an underground group of this site that talks about this. And they definitely talk about the ancient civilizations here, but how the Romans ended up slowly turning to this area as well. 
and they definitely talk about these uh these two bun shaped copper cakes which is some of the, one of them's in the british museum and i think one of them's in the national museum of wales which you can see on their collections online um rather than just go in there and ask them to have a look but these cakes weighed about 25 to 30 pounds um and they were stamped with iv fs which we will have a look at as well these are the other copper cakes that they found this is the one that's in um the welsh uh, museum and it is something that you see crop up when you google it online there is so much that is coming from here these these copper cakes that uh, um you definitely realize there's more evidence uh, coming out of this than we once thought so this is on the national museum of wales and um, the item number is 27.615 um and this was found in uh brindu um in anglesey um it was a surface find in 1871 and when they had a look at this, the documentation st said that it was somewhere in Anglesey. So someone actually dug deep into the archaeological uh, um, academic article um, journals and they found in the Arch archaeological journal of 1873, volume 30, it states that it was found in Brindu, um, which was near the Roscoch uh, railway station. Then they found another journal um, which discussed how um, this was found in Brinadu, and it was uh, approximately four kilometres east of Brinadu. Um, they even looked at further articles that went from the 60s to the 70s, and they were able to find how there was more discussions of this um, in Lambergoch, um, and how the connecting how all this, all these ingots, all these copper cakes that they're finding are from this fantastic site here and was something that was a legacy of the Romans, something that they had left behind. Um, but they definitely see how um, the, the, this, the, the, you see them found in farms, you see them found in gardens, um, and they, they find found even in the quarry itself sometimes. But this was thought um, to be uh, found uh, not far from quarry itself um but it's it's they think that this that the location that it was found it was absolutely fantastic to find something like this was uh, really interesting and was able to add, add more information um so obviously they found the two ingots which are now in the uh, british uh, museum that you can go and see but this one um it, it just causes confusion for people really because i think they're not really sure on where it came from but they know it came from this area i think they they, they just debate on whether it's from Grenadu, but the thing is Three articles have said that it's from Brindu, and I think they should actually listen to them now. Um, but they were able to say that um, it was about 279 millimetres in diameter, and in thickness, it was about 50 millimetres as well. Um, obviously, this is copper, um, and you can definitely go and see it um, in their archives in the National Museum of Wales, but it's just better to see it on um uh, online really but it, it's fantastic how this site here was um just definitely interesting for co roman copper mining as well as ancient copper mining um they have found 18 such cakes that have been found anglesey around anglesey they were weighing up to about 42 pounds as well they have found smaller um parts of these copper cakes etc and it it's really interesting to look into all of this um, and to just see how the, the trades is just coming from all of this. We're seeing how it has connections with Lancaster and uh, Swansea, and it clearly is something that the Romans thought, yes, we actually want to have a stronghold around here um, because it just allows them to uh, to grow economically, allowed them to grow with trade. Um, and I just think that's what their aim was. So we get to this uh, place here now, um, which at the bottom, you can see what it looks like. It's just banks and ditches at this point. It is very uh, watery. Um, some of the land, it's, it's not a very ideal place for actually going to stroll around in your best shoes, really. But it's absolutely beautiful to look at because you can imagine what had been going on in this area. And this is something that is discussed quite a lot in um, the book. So when we look at uh, Kyalib, um, this was just literally um, opposite the uh, Roman fort in Carnarvon. So it was on the southwest area of Anglesey. And um, it, it was near some hut circle settlements as well. Um, but this was a settlement that was defended by an enclosure. So uh, 
it, it, it's, it's absolutely fantastic because you see how it was occupied occupied from um, the second century to the early medieval period. And they, they know this from the uh, piece of evidence they had found there. So they have obviously found um, bits and bobs such as uh, uh, pottery, such as, um, I'm not sure if they found any coins there, um, but again coins of things like this is absolutely fantastic to look at you can just have more information but there is a page called the uh, metholithic uh, portal that really discusses this in great detail and has people's images you have the exact coordinates if you are interested um, but they've put this down as multi-period um, but I think again this was just something I think this just works this way of living and um, you can definitely see how the, the, this fantastic structure is thought to be reconstructed here you have this wooden fence all around and then the, the water the middle and um, not that very deep but very uh, steep to go down in and then you have another fence that goes around and I think this was um, defensive really because you wouldn't have two of these walls just to keep animals in and um, you can definitely see how they think that you, you would have had these roundhouses um, and then some smaller ones in the corner and um, possibly for storage um, looks like they're having a picnic there really um, really strange um but you can see how they would have had a bit for the animals to live in as well possibly a little barn um but again a lot of the evidence here is just based on the way the, the earth looks and when you do look at it on aerial photography you can definitely see how there was a lot of ditches going on here you can definitely see where the entrance was um but not a lot of focus has uh, been pro brought out to this and some people think that this is a medieval homestead with a moat um and, and you definitely see how this could work. And I think this is why um, it was used in the medieval period, maybe for defence. Maybe they were very sure that this could be a place that was hit again. But they found an excavation that they had an excavation in 1865, which kind of goes against this reconstruction that we have there, because they found one circular building on the south, but they found um, on the east rectangular buildings on the east side so they think about two rectangular buildings so again this reconstruction can be thrown out but the moat that they have is correct um and they definitely see how um the, the, the kadu actually discusses the origins to be um of the third century um possibly the second but um, they, they, they put this down due to this evidence of the hut circle and they had a hearth there um Again, suggesting further ways of living um, and definitely uh, creating things, uh, possibly um, further trade. Um, but it was very frustrating because a lot of the dating for this site doesn't directly come from the site, it comes from a site that's nearby. And I think that's one thing that's frustrating because sometimes they could be similar, but something could be completely different. But they have found pottery here, um, and this is why it further backed up Kadu's claims of this being from the second century to the fourth century was this pottery um, they found on the north side there was periwinkle shells and a medieval coin that was under a layer of peat as well um, on the north side so if, it is quite interesting very small finds that are coming from this um, it seems like a lot of wood was being used for the structures here and that's possibly why we don't see them in, uh, today but we definitely do have a legacy left in the landscape of this moat and of this settlement and I, I just wish we knew more about it rather than just um, going off on the excavation in 1865. Um, sometimes people don't tend to look in the archives and if you do look at the articles from possibly the 1800s you definitely see how there's things that have been missed or things that have been discussed and not seen as relevant and you see them as relevant now so it would be interesting if people just went back to uh, the, the archives in terms of that as well um if my yes it's finally working so this is the one that is actually represented in St Fagans um and when you do google it obviously it is saturated a lot with uh, St Fagans um but these were thought to be Iron Age. It's thought to be something that carried on in the uh, medieval, uh, not the medieval, but the Roman period. And it was compared to a settlement called um, Bush Farm in Gwynedd. Um, but the excavations here um, went from 1985 to 1987. It was a fantastic age for archaeology. You start having um, more credibility given to archaeologists by historians because of the, grow, uh, the growing technology. We definitely see how um, 
it, it's being funded by things like the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust. It, this is something that was of interest in the 80s, and I think it was this definitely this sense of excitement because of new technology. Like I said, St. Fagans, Cardiff, South Wales, does have a reconstruction of this, and it was created by um, school children. Um, and I do like how they've done it up inside because it's so warm and cosy. You have the fire on the inside in the centre, um, and you have um, all the living things around you. And you definitely see how this would have been warm and cosy and something that, again, I, I've sat in there with my whole family, and five of us sat in there, and it, you can definitely see how it would have been nice, warm, and cosy for all of us and keeping all the heat together. But I think I would have strangled them at one point um, if I had to live in that uh, a small space with them all the time. Um, but it, th again, this is thought to be a settlement that was held by the natives. So it's thought to be a small Iron Age farmstead um, in the east corner of Anglesey. But during the Bronze Age, Ages and the Iron Ages, uh, roundhouses were the most f common form of uh, houses, weren't we, from what we've seen. And so they've decided to reconstruct this based on the excavations. The excavation of this area revealed three substantial roundhouses and the earliest and the largest house um, was built during the Iron Age and it was enclosed by a timber stockade. The second roundhouse was thought to be built shortly before the Roman invasion, placed right next to the first one, while the stockade was upgraded to a more permanent rectangular shaped uh, bank and ditch. And then during the first millennium AD, the banks were eroding, the ditch was silting, and the third house was built on stone footing. So you definitely see with these houses, and I think we've seen that with um, this one here, it's, it's almost like a, a development in the way of building structures and the way of living. In. And this is what they've seen with the excavations here. This was an experimental reconstruction that they've done in uh, St. Fagans of the earliest two houses. And it, it, was, it was just because of the close proximity of each other, they formed one building. Um, and they, they call this the figure of eight or the conjoined roundhouses, or, or like an infinity symbol, really, isn't it? Um, but it's absolutely fantastic that you can. Uh, definitely get to interact with all of this as well um, and I know um, from when I went there they did have people um, when I used to go there trying to recreate the uh, the fences that they've got going on here um, which is just weaving uh, some stick through in and out I, I thought it was fantastic going there and um, I remember when I first discovered it because uh, as a child I used to get quite tired and so we couldn't always finish St Fagans all in one go but um, eventually uh, I managed to actually do more and when I first saw this it was absolutely fantastic and really I really enjoyed it and it, it is something that's really nice to actually experience and um, especially where it's situated in St Fagans as well. Um, and one thing I wanted to show you is from the excavation. So this is the excavation of this site so you see that there's three uh, buildings here so building A, building B, and then uh, building C. Um, and they compared this, um, this was in an article that compared it to, um, that compared it to uh, the bush farm. And it was quite interesting how similar they were. And you can definitely see how comparative archeology span is really helpful with things like this. Um, but they were able to pinpoint what they were able to find here. Um, so they, they find things like um, these little black dots here being Roman courseware. They find things like um, Samian pottery in, in this area here with this uh, Samian pottery there, Samian pottery there. Um, there's, there's things like storage jars that's being plonked all over the place. So you definitely see how you have a, an, an, an Inig Valley beaker there. Um, you definitely see how there's storage jars being found here. A lot of the evidence is being found in the most recent build in this one here. Um, but it is absolutely fantastic to look at. I, and I do like it when you see archaeological reports that put all of the findings in something like this. It just makes it easier for me to read. And you can definitely see how there's more context going on with these uh, places of living. And I, it, that's what I see anyway. Um, but you see things like rotary querns uh, being found in places like here. Um, they found things like, uh, this is really difficult to actually see, and I've got my glasses. Um, you have things like glass being found in areas like this. Um, definitely uh, seeing things like more beakers that are off the area. Um, I'm trying to find, uh, the, oh, yes, so these are a, a 
beads or armlets that have been found, so jewellery. Um, I think possibly the armlets have been evidence of uh, the metal working on the site. And maybe, again, you've seen this Roman relationship for the archaeology. So even though this is something that the natives lived in, they were having a um, uh, connection with the Romans uh, and is seen through all the uh, material evidence that have been found. I just think this is a fantastic way of showing off the material culture of the site. So hopefully I've been able to show that Anglesey has a wide, wide variety of archaeological evidence of the Roman period, and that can shed, shed light on the relationship of the Romans with the area of Anglesey and with the people who live there and how it was important for their economy, for their trade, and how they were able to progress a, a stronghold and power on the area. When you look at ruins of forts and rural settlements, you can see how Anglesey was thriving before the Romans came about. And I think that's why the Romans had a motive to actually come here. But it was, I think it's important because we definitely see in terms of Mediterranean um, glass and seeming wear as well and other things, we're seeing how there's a connection with the Romans and the wider world. And I think that's something that's uh, stayed with uh, Wales um, throughout history um, but I think it's interest and I think we see this international interest um, because there is discussion from people from uh, the, the Italy that come into this and look at all the Roman stuff you definitely see how there's discussions of people from the Mediterranean that looks at the pottery and looks at the glass and you definitely see people of Wales having an interest you definitely pull in people from islands people from England in terms of this in terms of the connection with the uh, the copper mining but I definitely think this is an important area um, to focus on and again we will look further into the natives and how they live there um, but yes uh, th th that's that for me so uh, we'll close this up now oh press the button anyway managed to work um, so anyone is there anything that you'd like to ask Anne? Oh only um it was really interesting to see the intermediates, you know, buildings between the Iron Age and the mm. Roman, and Roman periods, you know, the natives, how, how people lived um, in the Roman period, really. And, um, you know, the, they didn't all live in the Vicas. So there were yeah. farmsteads and things like that, you know, which it's great to see the roundhouses, though, and, and all that. Um, evidence, you know, mm. um, and uh, I I stayed at Anglesey once near Paris Mountain, and my husband walked up it. <laughs> it's a very it's a very popular area to go walking, apparently. Yeah, I, I can imagine that being a very tiring walk, though, but a, a rewarding one as well. Um, I'm not sure whether any of you can see, um, but the. I'll try and bring it closer, but the, the squares are um, the squares are settlement with a defended enclosure. But you definitely see how the circles all around it, and the circles are meant to represent um, just uh, that they're just hut circles settlements. And um, you definitely see how the red ones there, are the the Roman fort, um, and you have the the defended uh, structures of the natives surrounded by these hut circle settlements. Um, and definitely see the other Roman fort on the other side there um, and by the Paris mountain um, there's two defended uh, hilltop structures almost here as well so you definitely see that there's some rich archaeology definitely from the natives yeah. in this area and something that I would like to focus on in another lesson um, so that would be quite interesting so well, thank you Anne um, and uh, Peter anything that you'd like to ask or add well, yeah, you talked, you said about the Roman copper mines, but that was mining was done by the local people long before the Romans got there. Mm -hmm. And it was only because the local people were mining the copper and the copper was rich in the area that the Romans went there in the first place. Yeah, it which is what I said, that was their motive. Of value for them. Yeah. And yeah. You're, not, you're knocking the local people, but the local people were in some respects superior to the, to the Romans. I don't think I was knocking the local people. Uh, I've, I've, I said that they were obviously using that, that area and mining before the uh, Romans, and I gave evidence of them smelting. And it was a Roman mine. It wasn't. 
what I'm talking about is the Romans actually working there. I mentioned how well, it, it was... by the local people to sell well, I to said that, Peter. I said that it was used by the... Uh, yes, I did, Peter. I said that this was used by the ancient... This is an ancient mine that they had found evidence of, and it was then a motive for the Romans to actually take over and turn into a Roman mine for copper themselves. No, no. It was mined by the local people. That, that's why I just said it was an ancient mine. No, you Rome. just said it's Roman, but it wasn't. It was the local people's mine. It was taken over by the Romans for that. No, that they, was their motive. The Romans, were, the Romans took the materials, yes. They bought the material. They traded for the materials. But I think it was um, really early, you know, but we, we're talking about the Romans at the moment. I mean, I think it was before Neolithic, wasn't it? It was, it was there, there is but, evidence of ancient so, civilizations, like I said, mining there, yeah, but the Romans yeah. then clearly had um, mining there themselves as well. So whether yeah, they Roman allowed soldiers. the local people to mine with them, there is Roman ingots and Roman inscriptions that are being left all over the place there. I mean, which That's why they came here. They wouldn't have come here if we didn't have assets, you know. That they exactly. They would have uh, want to... Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the local people already proved that the assets were there and they already produced the material that the Romans wanted. Yeah, the so fact that the Romans fighting. stamped their name on it or stamped them, that, that's by the by, but it was produced by the local people. And same with the strongholds, you know, they were built, the stone was quarried and built by the local people mm. under the, uh, the guide, guidance of the Romans. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so the, it, it was a, a motive for the Romans to come here, of and course. and that was what that was what I've been saying throughout all of it was that it, it was a motive for the Romans to actually take over because I think they saw how Wales was able to thrive. It was a thriving area for trade for mining, and I think the Romans wanted a piece of that themselves. So that's why I think they closed them off um, from Carnarvon onto the other side as well. So uh, thank you for that, Peter. Um, Richard, anything you'd like to uh, ask or add? No, no, really interesting. No, thank you, Richard. Um, Pat? Hang on, I'll ask her to unmute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just surprised they didn't build any towns or, or buildings, you know? It's like it was just a military place. And Mm, I, and I think it was definitely, I think it was the, the strong presence of the local people that maybe uh, the Romans didn't want to maybe invade too much onto it because it was probably best to keep the local people on their side rather than really annoy them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, and I'll see you next week. Um, and look after yourselves as well. Um, keep safe. Take care. Can you okay. tell me what, you, what we're doing tomorrow, Jess? Um, tomorrow, oh gosh, my mind's gone completely blank. Let me go and get my book on it. Oh. Have you got, you haven't got it, have you? Oh, I've got it, the Hebrides. Oh, right, okay. So uh, we'll be looking at uh, a lot of things there, um, definitely in terms of uh, uh, the, the Isle of Lewis, the chessmen, the Lewis chessmen, um, the Kalanish stones. Uh, Peter had this with us on Tuesday. Um, oh, right, yeah. So, yes, it, it was an interesting one, wasn't it, Peter, it with those chess yeah. men? Yeah, Beautiful. Yes, they were okay. amazing, they were. Right. Yeah. That's great. Uh, well, all the best for tomorrow. We'll, well, I hope our new venue will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Anne. Thank Would you so you much for helping us with it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank okay, you. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.